Good morning and welcome to another morning of September RSA. So this morning we have uh, two sessions, two things happening. So it's going to be the first, we're going to have a talk, um, which I'll introduce in a second. Then we're going to have a five minute break at 11 o'clock. And then we're going to have our panel, which will be missing narratives and discussions around diversity and inclusion in research software engineering. But first up, we're going to have a talk by Mark McManus from Microsoft. He's going to give us a talk now about research in the cloud. So I'll hand over to you now, Mark. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yep, that's all great. Excellent. Just sharing the screen. And there we go. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining this today. Really appreciate it. My name is Mark Manis um, from Microsoft. I'm the Azure lead in the education team. So I work with universities across the UK um, and some research um, centers as well. So really good to, to have you online, really thank you. It would be good to get some feedback actually about um, uh, working with Microsoft, working with Azure. Uh, I just wanted to give you a sort of a whistle stop tour. Some of you may have already be aware of this. Uh, so apologies for that. I will go through this relatively quickly uh, to, to, uh, to get through to the meaty stuff. Uh, hopefully that will be of uh, more interest to you. Uh, so uh, Microsoft has 62 Azure regions around the world. Uh, of which there are well over uh, 100 data centers. Uh, that's relevant besides it being a marketing slide. Uh, that's relevant in terms of research. You work with several universities where they have centers and um, sites, campuses around the world. Uh, so they're using our network and our interconnect uh, for Azure regions uh, to get application services, uh, compute capabilities more local to, to those environments. So I thought I'd include that one. Um, we do have a huge amount of infrastructure around our data centers, as you can imagine. Uh, lots of security, lots of services available in terms of protecting those environments. Uh, it is a global infrastructure. We have uh, uh, over 2 million miles of fiber interconnecting them. That's private fiber. Um, we also have connect to the Janet network. Uh, so they run uh, uh, an enhanced uh, networking service for us called Express Route. Uh, so we work very closely with Janus and other NRENs uh, around the world in interconnecting our uh, network and backbone to the, the NRENs uh, services. Uh, our data center is pretty big. Uh, as you can imagine, that's, that's a picture of our uh, data center in, in, uh, in America um, being built. And for every region, there is at least three uh, of these buildings. Uh, so we invest a, a huge amount of money in these services. Uh, for our customers. Um, interestingly, they're all carbon neutral and have been since 2012. Uh, so that's began by offsetting our carbon footprint, um, but with you know, obviously uh, projects, et cetera, to, to plant trees, to, to be more carbon friendly. We're now working towards uh, finalization of uh, having um, um, uh, naturally, uh, so sorry, uh, uh, energy that's uh, produced uh, without using car, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, the picture at the bottom is pr uh, Project Natic, that's uh, looking at putting data centers uh, under the sea for cooling. Um, and so that, that was that was a data center trial for that, uh, which is off the northeast coast of Scotland. Uh, and uh, recently we, we pulled that up after uh, three years being down there. And so uh, looking into the anal analytics around that, et cetera, and looking potentially uh, to go into production. So again, all that kind of new advances and in innovations. Uh, we tried several times in terms of working with uh, researchers. Microsoft has uh, relationships with every university in the UK and, and other research centers, um, predominantly with the central IT team, central IT services uh, with the universities. Um, and years ago, we, we tried with anybody who knows Kenji Takeda from our um, Microsoft research uh, department. Uh, he worked with uh, universities in trying to um, help uh, researchers understand the, the capabilities of Azure. And as I say, this was three, four years ago. Uh, interestingly, the relationships that we had with central IT, we had um, CIO is not so happy that we were uh, working independently. Uh, obviously, CIOs and the function of the, the IT department, they have uh, overall responsibility for uh, managing uh, compliance, security, et cetera, for universities in terms of IT. And so they wanted us to work with them uh, rather than uh, working independently with researchers. So it's a, in terms of our relationship with the university, an interesting balance over the, uh, the, the past four years in terms of um, 
uh, using Azure for, for research. Uh, and so again, we'd love to get feedback. What's the best approach? How do we work with, with yourselves and central IT and making uh, sure that things are better? Um, and so see some of the, the research challenges we've, we've had uh, and we tried to address uh, by working with central IT and researchers. Um, so uh, you know, budgets um, being spent by, by researchers in their own environments, which is fine, uh, but then uh, central IT wanting to make sure that there's governance and protection and security over them. Um, Requests to central IT sometimes can take a long time. Uh, so academics and researchers uh, can often take uh, months to get access to environments that aren't readily available within the capacity uh, of central IT. So procurement, building, uh, building the environments, et cetera, can often take too long. Um, and uh, typically uh, research and academic uh, departmental environments um, typically like the governance that central IT want and, and desire uh, to, to ensure that security level to backups and failover is all built into the environments to, to protect uh, the, the research that's going on. And so all these kind of issues that we try to work with central IT and, and researchers, and by no means perfect uh, at the moment, but uh, it, it's something that we're working on and working with, and, and we have some really good success stories in terms of making that work by using uh, Azure to sort of bridge the gap, if you like, and to address those kind of uh, issues. So cloud services provides that agile environment. So rather than waiting for services uh, to be procure, procured and built, um, we can turn these on immediately. It's, it's infrastructure, infrastructure as code. Uh, and so we can provide on-demand services uh, and functions to provide that front-end uh, interface to provide uh, that link to building those environments. Uh, obviously, that means rapid access to services. Um, also flexible. So as uh, research projects change, uh, we can uh, adapt and flex uh, the services in Azure. So rather than having a fixed uh, CapEx investment in, in, in some kit, uh, we can adapt uh, and spread uh, the resource elsewhere and turn off uh, environments that we don't need uh, mid research flow. Uh, depending on the requirements of the research projects. Access to cognitive services. So again, so uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, vision capabilities, speech capabilities, et cetera, are all accessible uh, via the, the Azure services so it can be called in from code uh, as required uh, and so on. So th there's some of the issues that we've tried to address by using Azure uh, cloud services. Uh, also sustainability, that's uh, we found in, in terms of the, the, the university sustainability, um, reducing the carbon footprint is pretty high on the agenda at the moment uh, for most boards at uh, universities. Uh, and so obviously using uh, services that are carbon neutral already uh, is an advantage to that. So uh, we'll see more, we'll see more strategic use of cloud because, because of that reason. Industry accreditations I'll come to in a moment. <laughs> Also benefit from new innovations. Uh, we're actually working with uh, University of Southampton uh, on a project called Project Silica, uh, which is etching data into glass. Uh, so obviously something that's etched into glass will last uh, literally hundreds of years uh, rather than current media. Uh, and so it's multi-layering using special laser technology. Um, and so the capacity that we can get on those glass slides is huge. Uh, and so hopefully that will come into production within the next uh, two years uh, for archive uh, research data and other uh, forms of data that need long-term uh, storage capabilities. So again, benefiting from those type of uh, innovations uh, from uh, Azure as we develop them. Um, this is a, an example. It's, it's an example that's been around a, a while, but I, I really like it. It's a great example of the use of cloud services uh, where local services uh, didn't quite meet uh, the requirement. Uh, so this is uh, Professor Holloman from uh, University of Newcastle uh, up in the Northeast, uh, was working on uh, this project, which is Petascale Cloud Supercomputing for a Terapexel Visualization of a Digital Twin. Uh, and that's as about as, as much as I know from the technology and the, the, the information side. Um, but basically uh, required huge amounts of GPU capabilities. Uh, and uh, Newcastle is a research university. They have lots of high performance compute capability, uh, but wasn't quite the right technology that uh, Professor Holman required. Um, uh, looked at Archer and, and rejigging the service for Archer, didn't quite, didn't want to quite change it in terms of the, 
uh, the requirements for that. Uh, went to procurement and said, well, how much is this going to cost? It was literally in the millions in terms of procurement, and they were looking at uh, at least a year in terms of procuring uh, the environment. So they used Collapse. They came to, to Microsoft and they worked with us uh, and um, Professor Hon and the team ran up over a thousand uh, GPU nodes uh, and delivered around 14 petaflops uh, of capability, uh, but over uh, two or three months. So not, not um, in terms of testing, testing the scripting, testing the algorithms, et cetera. Um, and so cost minimal compared to the overall CapEx cost. And, and therefore he was able to publish and continue his research on the paper. So it's a very interesting, a, a great example of based out capability. So what was promoting is, is not replacing high performance compute on premise, mm -hmm. although we do have one university who's looking to migrate their existing high performance compute into Azure. Generally it's about based out capabilities, it's about uh, that that sort of uh, extra custom requirement that doesn't quite fit the on-premise environments or something I need extra capacity for uh, that we don't have on-premise, uh, we can turn out to, to Azure. Uh, trusted environment as well, we, we do have universities uh, who are looking at, uh, telling us that uh, a lot of the research grants they're applying for are now asking for accreditations, whether that's ISO accreditations or NHS or whatever it may be. Uh, cloud, uh, cloud does have those accreditations. We, we spend a lot of money uh, on making sure that we're adhering to these accreditations uh, and making a safe and secure environment. Uh, and so uh, we've had several universities using this to enable them to apply for more uh, research grants, uh, which is kind of, kind of an interesting slant on accreditation, and, um, which is typically seen as a, a cost. Uh, they're seeing it as a, a benefit in terms of enhancing their research capabilities and their capacity to take on more research uh, grants. Uh, often we're seen as the evil empire uh, in terms of past experiences with um, uh, open source. However, uh, since 2014, we've embraced uh, open source. And in fact, uh, Microsoft contributes uh, more to open source than any other commercial organization. Um, uh, and so obviously very relevant in terms of research and research capabilities across uh, the open source uh, projects that are, that are out there uh, and so available and supported uh, in, in the Azure environments. Uh, so you can bring uh, what you're using in terms of open source uh, to the Azure environment. So I think that's an important one. So going back to the, the case of us uh, having existing relationships with central IT and, and, and the teams within central IT wanting us to manage um, research uh, with central IT, so providing an overall governed uh, environment. And so this is something that we've worked with uh, UK universities on in terms of pr providing that sort of central research management, um, providing the automation, so infrastructure as code on demand type services, uh, and providing sort of portals into Azure dependent on the requirement. So these are the three core um, pieces really to our research offering. Um, as I say, central research management, automation is key. So being able to spin things up and down, uh, scale out, scale in uh, as required. And then the on-demand uh, research services through uh, a, a custom portal. So just uh, skipping to how we set things up, we're, as I say, we have a, uh, agreements, Microsoft has agreements with all the universities in the UK. And as part of those agreements, they can obviously uh, run up Azure environments. So the Azure environments are, are split into what we call enrollments or the Azure agreement. This is both a, a commercial and a technical structure. Uh, and this, uh, an enrollment would, would work with uh, a reseller that we work with and, and that's what would, how the billing would take place. However, it's also um, its own entity. And so there is the option to have multiple enrollments. So, why would you have multiple enrollments? Well, we, we work with the likes of o uh, Oxford and Cambridge universities where uh, it's very collegiate, obviously. So uh, a lot of the colleges have their own autonomous environments, including um, IT services and uh, finance, et cetera, et cetera. And so whilst we, ha we have one overall Microsoft agreement with the university, uh, we can apply different enrollments, different environments uh, and billing environments to each of the colleges. Um, and so they have their own Azure enrollment or Azure agreement, as we call it. Another example is at University of Sheffield, the MRC, which is an engineering arm, 
uh, they have their own enrollment. Uh, so underneath, underneath the, the overall Microsoft agreement, there's a separate enrollment for AMRC. So there is generally uh, multiple enrollments per university dependent on the requirement. And so this is something that we can structure together to give that autonomous structure and billing uh, from a finance perspective. Within the enrollments, once they're, they're created, you set, okay, create the subscriptions again, which is uh, another way of, of um, managing and structuring the Azure environment. And then within each of the subscriptions, you have resource groups and then the resources themselves are applied within those groups. Uh, so just to give you a bit of a picture in terms of overall management structure. So at the top end, we have the, the enterprise or the enrollment, the Azure agreement. Uh, that can be then split down to departmental uh, functions. Uh, within the, uh, the depart departments can then be split into accounts and then we can go down to the actual subscriptions or the resources themselves. And so uh, an example of a structure would be universities at the high end of the enrollment, uh, central IS uh, as a department level, and then they may have accounts that represent dev test staging production. And then the, the relevant subscriptions with the resources, the compute, the storage, whatever it may be uh, within each one of those areas. So this, is, this gives us order and structure and we can apply different roles to different levels. And that could be finance roles to see how the budgets are, are going, technical roles and administrator. So at the department level, we could have an administrator managing the central IS environment and therefore has an administrative access to dev test staging production. We can also apply accounts uh, at the account level. Um, so again, they just have access to that environment. And so uh, with working with central IT, central IS, uh, one of the things that we uh, wanted to, to do was um, create the same, a similar structure for research. So again, on, we're using the same structure within the same enrollment, we can create a, an extended structure for research under department level and then break that down into colleges, uh, schools, research, a research group, academic department. And of course, the relevant researchers will have access to their services, their subscriptions without having to see uh, anybody else's. Uh, and so it gives us a, a way of managing and having a governed environment. But as I say, we can also provide uh, a structure uh, that um, uh, sorry, a, 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 an enrollment separate for research. So we do have some universities where they have a separate enrollment just for research. Uh, so again, they get the direct billing, they get the autonomous uh, function in terms of the overall management. But there is accountability in terms of the governance of the environment uh, if you take it at the enrollment level. So we, we're trying to give uh, options uh, in terms of, of creating these services. So as that's an example of that, where we've got the management structure at the research level. So this would be an example of uh, a university where the, the research department, the research lead is taken on the enrollment directly, uh, direct billing from the reseller. And then that can be split down to the department, school level, research, a research group. Uh, and we can align the resources and subscriptions uh, accordingly. Uh, this gives you an overall map architecture, if you like. So at the top end, you can see we've got, uh, hopefully see we've got the enterprise enrollment at the top end, which can be broken down to departments and account levels and the relevant subscriptions. Uh, typically, we have a hub and spoke design in terms of networking, uh, where we, uh, we share the, the networking, especially if there's an express route service uh, via the Janet network, via JISC, uh, out to our data centers and to your um, uh, to hybrid connectivity to your own environment. Um, so typically we have a hub and spoke for the networking side of things across the subscriptions and accounts. Uh, so this is a way of structuring the overall environment. <clears throat> this is something called a landing zone. Uh, so where we create uh, this structure. Uh, and as I say, that's a high level architecture view on that. Uh, <clears throat> conscious of time, just going back to the um, services, we can split out into resource management portals. Uh, we have one for Azure Labs, which is specific for uh, curriculum use, typically some computer labs and management where the academics themselves um, can manage the resources for their students. Uh, we also have Azure Dev Tests for development, uh, which is a VDI capability. So for Linux and, and Windows machines for developers developing uh, research uh, projects. And then Cycle Cloud, which is high performance compute, uh, high throughput compute. Um, 
managing the utilization, the cost management, who has access to it, etc. Um, so managing high performance compute environment. So using CycleCloud to actually go ahead and build a high performance compute environment by keying in certain uh, criteria. We have to begin wrapping up now because we've got to have time for questions. Yes, certainly. So again, just wanted to give you an overview of uh, Azure and some of the capabilities and the way how we work with central IT and the structures. So yeah, any questions around that, any comments, any feedback, very much appreciated. Cool, so I'll start sharing the question slide then. Certainly, thank you very much. Okay. So yeah, so great so, question. Okay, so I'm going to basically start from the top question. So uh, the first one up there is, can spend by researchers be capped to stop them accidentally spending the department's cloud budget? Uh, yes, they can. So soft caps can be applied, budgets can be applied. Uh, we don't del uh, delete, obviously, the, when you store data, um, we don't stop uh, the storage. We won't delete the storage. So the storage remains in play. Uh, and you have 180 days to, to remove that if the budgets run out. Uh, but yes, we can uh, cap uh, budgets. And typically what we do, working with the RSEs, will not, necessar not, not necessarily give uh, researchers direct access, carte blanche access to Azure. Typically, it's working with the RSEs to deliver the MATLAB service, the, the three node cluster, the high performance compute environment, whatever it may be, and giving them access to the environment rather than the underlying Azure. There is an option to do that. However, um, you know, typically we're delivering the resource to the researchers rather than carte blanche access uh, to Azure. Cool, that's a very good answer. Okay, so the next one, uh, can I prepay for Azure? So if I have a grant, I want to spend for only say 5,000 pounds, but my university won't let me sign up to a monthly pay-as-you-go subscription. Uh, so yes, you can. Uh, so there's a, a way where you can put Azure credit uh, into the, the service. So um, and, and and then use the credit uh, as you as you go along. And you can do that up to three years. You can do it yearly or three years. Uh, so if the project lasts more than one year, typically you'd say oh, I want a three year uh, credit. I'll put my five k credit down, and I'll consume that over three years. Again, very good answer. Very good service. Okay, next one, Project Natick is cool. The UK has lots of coastline and lots of offshore wind. Do you think this puts the UK in a good position for undersea data centers? Uh, yes, I mean, that's one of the reasons that, um, that Microsoft chose uh, the UK. Again, obviously, uh, large island, um, lots of cool seas, uh, literally cool seas. Um, so you, you, you're absolutely right. And, and relatively close in terms of providing that kind of resource uh, to large cities, large environments, so yes. Uh, it's 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 part of the project moving forward. So speaking as someone who comes from a coastal town, I think, yeah, this is a good way for regenerating our coastal towns. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, very cool. much. So, uh, next question from James. Do you think there's a place for university on-prem HPC in the future? If so, is there a way that cloud HPC and on-prem HPC can work better together? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at that all the time. What, when it, because where Microsoft's come from, we've come from on-premise and we've moved into cloud. Uh, in terms of our service. So hybrid is really important to us in providing that hybrid connectivity. Most of our customers have hybrid connectivity to cloud. So that's really, really important. We, we invest an awful lot in that. So yes, uh, is, is the answer to that question. Working with the likes of GISC in terms of network connectivity, making sure that the latency is low as possible. Uh, so, so whilst we have one university moving all the high performance compute to a cloud and there's specific reasons for that, most are looking at hybrid connectivity. Cool. I think we do have time to do both of these uh, in yeah. the last minute. So can central management enforce good common sense policies for research of virtual machines? So firewall updates, patching, key base login, et cetera. Yes. And this is one of the key aspects of, of working with central IT and providing an overall governed environment. So I can have pol uh, I can cascade policies down to subscriptions and across all subscriptions and environments. So as a, a, you know, as a central IT, that's ideal. I can put governance across the whole structure. Uh, whilst the, the, the researchers can still have autonomy in terms of what they want to run. So I'm applying policies and templates to the environment in terms of governance, backup, failover, security, et cetera, and patching. Well, I think you have time for one, one word answer for this one. You mentioned Microsoft having embraced open source, given embrace, extend, extinguish. How far away is open source from extinguish? 
<laughs> That's a great question. Um, we, uh, I think we're investing more in open source. So Satya Nadella, who's our uh, new CEO, he is absolutely emphatic that Microsoft loves open source and has changed that uh, view and focus. Mm-hmm. So no, we embrace uh, and see open source as the, um, you know, uh, as a way of, of enhancing what we offer. So we, we don't try and take it and put custom wrap around it. Uh, now we'll, we'll we'll take it and say, try and make it easy to manage, etc. But won't change the core. We'll contribute to it. So say, it's about to... Extending and extending rather than extinguishing. <laughs> that has been uh, my experience, and I have to say, I'm a very happy VS Code user. Ah, good man. Recommend that to everybody. Um, thank you very much, Mark. That was thank an excellent. You all. Really appreciate the questions. Cool. What we're going to do now is we're going to have a five minute break before we move on to the panel, which will be missing narratives and discussions around diversity and inclusion in research software engineering. So you have five minutes to have a quick break.
Okay. Ah, hello, everybody. So, um, welcome to this panel session. Um, just one moment while I bring up my screen, I will share with you the details of this panel. So this is the panel session about uh, missing narratives in discussions around diversity and inclusion in research software engineering. Uh, and the panel session is chaired by Malvika Sharan. Um, and um, I think I'll just pass over to you, Malvika. Um, are you happy to introduce now? Okay, great. Thanks, James. Trying to share my screen. Oops. I should have been better prepared. I forgot that you're recording and <laughs> these are not the best views. Anyway, here we are. Hello everybody. Thank you for being here and attending this panel. Uh, I am Malvika Sharan. I am uh, the research associate at the Alan Turing Institute and a community manager for the Turing Way project. I have been talking about diversity, inclusion, and belonging from my limited experience for several years. And I consider myself very privileged to be in spaces where I have the opportunity to speak and be listened to. Therefore, I chose the theme Missing Narrative for the panel to intentionally make space for voices that are not only marginalized, but often missing when discussing a small subset of issues in diversity and inclusion. It is my absolute honor to open this panel today. Uh, though I have taken the lead in organizing, it is a result of several months of discussions, background work and collective efforts of several people. Firstly, thanks to Michelle Barker and Jeremy Cohen for reaching out to me with the proposal to design this panel and to make this panel multifaceted, we connected with Roland Mosbergen. He is one of those thought-provoking voices in RSC that I truly think we can learn tremendously from, and I'm glad to have him as our co-organizer and moderator today. Then these are our panelists. We are really fortunate to host these incredible panelists who come from a range of technical expertise, intersectional identities, and lived experiences. They were nominated through a public nomination form shared across different RSC networks. Finally, thanks to RSC Society for providing the accessibility and honoraria fund to support this event and the September RSC organization team, especially James Womack and Kristen Merritt for their support, coordination, and patience. I have a few housekeeping. Uh, we will be using Etherpad today for sharing agenda points and note-taking. Um, we will share the link in the chat, but the short link is bit.ly forward slash 2021-0928 panel. B A N E L. Um, we'll add that in the chat. Please help us capture notes from today's session so we can share it beyond this session. And due to limited duration of this event uh, and the interest in facilitating informal discussion that will be triggered by this panel, we have planned a follow up Zoom call at 11 UTC, which is one hour from now. Um, all of these information are in Etherpad. And to ensure that the, the safest space for uh, the, our space is safe for people to speak and share their thoughts. Uh, we will enable a waiting room, so please add your name in the etherpad from line 79 onwards, so we know we will uh, let you in. Finally, I want to acknowledge that discussions like this cannot always cover all the intersectional topics and often surface challenging emotions, especially for our panelists as they share their lived experiences, but also those who are listening in. Therefore, please be respectful, understanding, and considerate in all your interaction in chat, notes, and discussions. Feel free to step away from your computer and come back as it is helpful for you. And with that, I'm delighted to hand it over to Roland to set the tone and moderate the panel. To you, Roland. Thanks, Malvika. Let's go with this one. Okay. Uh, is that okay? All right. So, it's an honor to, to do this. And uh, if this looks like we haven't practiced, that's probably on me because we have done a lot of work in the background. Thanks to Malvika, she's done a fantastic job on this. So what we wanted to do was to create this inclusive, these inclusive communities in research software engineering 
uh, by centering on intersectional perspectives and increasing awareness of power imbalances in the research. And the three uh, areas that were sort of flagged was the global south. Oh, sorry, that's my global south, disability and mental health. But the challenge is that uh, when you're thinking about intersectionality, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, it's a combination of these and many other things. It, it is not straightforward. And so what we had discussed early on was this idea of focusing on action. And the two things that came up were advocate for people from one or more marginalized groups and redefine merit. So why would you send them people from marginalized groups? Well, this is a great example of Vanessa Nakate who was removed from a photo because, well, your guess is as good as mine. She was just removed. And as she said here, you know, you didn't just erase a photo, you erased a continent. And so if that person isn't there to be, if you don't send her from marginalized groups and they disappear, you may not even know that they had disappeared. And once you center, you can see the lack of opportunities and the potential that goes to waste. And here's an example that I'm not necessarily comfortable with, but it's an example of what can happen if you haven't got the right support around you. So media reports have suggested the teenagers have been treated poorly for several years. And the question then becomes, how much potential do they have that may have been denied them because they weren't being supported in the right way? And I think that's a really challenging storyline for me personally. And, and it's just to here to make sure that you're, you're understanding that, you know, this is some of the things that people have to deal with. And when you start to combine these, intersectionality increases the difficulty of people being able to find career paths or even uh, work, uh, living in a day-to-day -day within our society. And for me, intersectionality is belonging to more than one marginalized group. And basically that means that you have more areas that can open you up for attack. Here's an example of Dior Vargas, who was diagnosed with severe depression and anxiety. And because she's also a woman of color, she would have been challenged on multiple fronts and therefore her degree of difficulty would increase. And you know, school was her only escape and after receiving treatment, she continued to excel academically. Now imagine if there was a situation where she wasn't receiving that treatment, would she still be able to live her, her, to her full potential? And what actually happens is that for people who haven't had these opportunities, the lack of opportunities over time reduces their employability. It reduces their ability to look competitive when you're looking at something even in a neutral perspective. And that's a challenge that if you don't take into account, any work that you do around the space will not, uh, will not be scalable. It won't be efficient nor effective. And therefore the key is to give people from marginalized groups more opportunities to make up for the ones that they've lost in the past and the ones they might lose in the future. So here's a great example, Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, I owe Marilyn Monroe a great deal. And you know, because she gave me that opportunity, I never had to play a small jazz club again. She didn't have to lean in. She didn't have to do more jazz uh, lessons. I'm, I'm assuming jazz lessons is a thing. Uh, I'm not into, I'm not, uh, affair with the jazz things. She didn't have to do things to do it. She just needed an opportunity and she was already good enough. And this is why you have to redefine merit in my mind. And so I, I love this picture. And this picture is, you know, you can see this one where there's a, a white man and a, a woman of color running a race that's supposed to be the same distance. What's the matter? It's the same distance, but the degree of difficulty is much different. And what I did is I created a model to help visualize this degree of difficulty based off some of the ideas in this picture so we can take that into account when we're talking about merit, quote unquote. 
Now, the, the risk is that this will dehumanize, and you do need to keep that in mind as we continue. But all models are wrong, but some are useful. So this model is definitely wrong. And it's wrong in a number of different ways. But the question is, is it useful? And I'm hoping to be able to show you that it is. So this is what I would call the intersectionality spectrum. And basically, you can see the de degree of difficulty. I don't want to move my mouse because I'm not really good with Max. <laughs> uh, the degree of difficulty on the y-axis shows you that uh, people within these categories, and again, categories are dehumanizing in themselves, uh, their, their sort of general degree of difficulty. So for me, I'm a person of color, and I'm sort of sitting in that second column of the degree of difficulty of two. But someone who is a person of color from the global south uh, with a disability could have a degree of difficulty of 27. And the way I calculate that degree of difficulty is two to the power of the number of marginalized groups that someone belongs to. And if someone's from a highly marginalized group, like in Australia, uh, the indigenous and refugees, uh, you would use three as the base. So three to the power of the number of marginalized groups they have. But the, the usefulness of this is to say, who are the people to my right in the graph? Who are the people who have a higher degree of difficulty than, than I, and how can I help them? And when you think about a hospital setting, when you go to hospital, it's not the order of when you got there that you get helped on, you're triaged to help those with, who need it most. So if you come in late, but you need a lot of help, uh, you'll get seen to first before someone who doesn't need as much help. So not only do you get seen earlier, you probably need more help. And we need to think about that whenever we're working on this, thinking about what is the intersectionality spectrum that we're dealing with, because these intersectionality, spectrum, intersectionality spectrums are very contextual. It will change from uh, environment to environment. And how can we help people to our right? That's the most important thing. So how can you help as an individual? Well, thinking about the two areas, one way, and there are more examples, uh, is to center people who are marginalized in your social media and use your privilege to give others opportunities. The other way uh, from a redefining merit is re redefine merit by taking into account people's degree of difficulty and looking to help people to your right. From an organizational point of view, you might want to aim for a 50% target of people from marginalized groups on the selection committee i.e. reviewing resumes and doing interviews, because they tend to have an innate feel for this, but it can help, especially when I've been into interviews and I've seen a diverse panel, it makes it, I feel a lot more comfortable. And redefine merit by increasing the emphasis on ability and potential, while de-emphasizing experience, because experience can be correlated with opportunity, not, not just ability. So if you wanted to find out more, there are some areas uh, here where I talk about uh, senior leadership and how to recruit diverse senior leaders, but it also works with uh, managerial and technical staff as well. So finally, uh, when we're talking about questions for the panelists and for the audience, so if you're in the audience and you have these stories or if you have this answer, please put it into the chat and we can work, work our way through those. Um, and the questions are, how did someone center and advocate for intersectionally marginalized voices? And how did that make a positive impact? And that doesn't have to be a positive impact on you. It might be something that you've done. Uh, it might be something that you only saw from a distance. The other one, the question is, when did someone redefine merit? And how did that make a positive impact? So I would like to talk about redefining merit and how did that make a positive impact? because I was working with the Research Software Engineering Australia New Zealand forming a committee. And I highlighted to them, if we went with a straight election, we wouldn't be able to keep the diversity that we had in our interim steering committee. So by using some of these precepts and making sure everyone understood the nuances, we were able to elect, I think it was a 91% uh, male population, we were able to select two co-chairs who were non-male and uh, were diverse. And um, 
that wasn't because we had a strategy or like an overarching strategy or if we did things or anything else like that. It's because we followed these simple principles. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I just wanted to reiterate what uh, Malvika said, is that we're trying to provide a safe emotional space. A lot of this is very emotional draining. That's why I have my, my tissues here. Um, I haven't cried yet, which is actually a bit of a bonus for me. And we want to make sure that when we're talking to the panelists, panelists, feel free to uh, um, decide what you'd like to be able to say. And if you have any troubles, um, I'll just check, to, check in with you, okay? So I would like to get uh, Charles, to, Charles Gray to introduce herself and then for her to tell her story. Charles, are you... Are you ready? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for moderating Roland and chairing Malvika. Uh, I'm Charles Gray. I were, I'm a one-time pianist, and I recently finished a PhD in reproducibility and statistical computing. My pronouns are she's the cat's mother, and I am currently a postdoc with the Evidence Synthesis Lab at Newcastle University working on network meta-analysis. I got to thinking about Roland's question that he proposed of when did someone redefine merit and how did that have a positive impact? And, um, and what popped into my mind was a, an intersection of things. When I was 17 years old, I was living in a housing program for homeless kids. I dropped out of high school three times. I was failing yet again. I really didn't think I'd finish high school. And my high school maths teacher pulled me out of class and very much surprised me by saying that he genuinely believed that I should pursue a career in mathematical science. Um, and those words really stayed with me. I, I didn't take up mathematics until I was in my 30s. Uh, and if, I'm not sure I would have if he hadn't encouraged me. I, as, as part of my um, science advocacy and whatnot, I um, had the opportunity to visit rural Australia and talk with very underprivileged high school students. So I'll, I'll drop into the chat a newspaper article about this. Um, and, and talking with the, the young women that I encountered on this tour, I was struck by how much they believed that they had no hope of a future in, in any kind of mathematical science or computing. They didn't feel that they, that, that was even something they could even consider. And I also recently read Feminism for the, the 99%. It's, uh, it's a manifesto written by three feminist uh, academics, and it critiques leaning culture that was promoted by Sheryl Sandberg, the chief operating officer of Facebook, which encourages women to sit at the table and take opportunities that are given to them. But what the, the manifesto critiques is that this only benefits privileged women. And for us to benefit the 99%, feminism needs to be intersectional. It needs to be eco-socialist and anti-capitalist. And something that bothers me about steminist um, advocacy is that, and, and advocacy for underrepresented minorities in science in general, is that we often focus on those who have already gained entry to this space. And what strikes me is what, what about the underrepresented minorities who could be here, but are not here because nobody ever took the time like my high school math teacher did to encourage me. Uh, what, what about the people that never became scientists but could have been great scientists? How do we reach the kids in Tasmania? And I feel in some ways that communicating this, this possibility to the people who aren't here is arguably even more important than helping the people who already got to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. Thanks very much. Now, I, I didn't forget to mention a couple of things. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Thanks very much for reminding me, Charles. And the second thing is that we wanted to go through a broad, uh, uh, broad um, in terms of the stories. So what we'll be doing is we'll be going through all the panelists first and maybe reaching out to see if there are any stories in the chat. And if we see any themes, you might circle back around to the panelists. Um, so uh, Yanina, 
would you be able to tell your story? I'm very excited about all of these panelists. This is just fantastic. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Shane. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, my name is Shanina, and I live with my husband and my two beautiful children in a small town in Argentina that is in South America. Uh, I'm a scientist, and early this year, I learned that what I was doing for the last 23 years at my job is called research software engineer. <laughs> I'm the first generation with a high school diploma, so I'm still learning how the academic world works, especially the, the international one. I'm going to try to answer both questions. Um, in my experience uh, with community of practice, and especially with Our Ladies. Uh, our Ladies was the first community that made me feel welcome. Uh, before that, I was rejected by other text community because uh, I didn't speak English. I'm a woman. I don't have a PhD. I am Latin American. I don't have many followers on Twitter, and I live too far away in, and in a very small town. Uh, our ladies centers and advocate for women and other gender minority, and it welcomed me when other, others did not. And I think that the positive impact uh, goes both ways. For the community, they get a passionate and hardworking members. <laughs> I started as a chapter organizer, and now I am part of the Our Ladies Global Team. I am a co-founder and co-chair of LatinR, which is a conference in Latin America for the, the R language. I'm co-chair of USAR, uh, and I lead teams that translate R and educational material into Spanish. I also help other communities like Mayar and the Carpentries, and I even co-founded a new community, Metadocencia, where we try to teach how to teach technology to Spanish-speaking educators. Uh, what I get, uh, the positive impact on me, uh, is knowing that I can be as good as anyone from anywhere. It is not obvious for some one of us. <laughs> I start from a disadvantaged place with fewer tools and resources, but I can still be a leader and I have an impact in my region with my people. It makes me wonder what people like me could achieve if we weren't wasting our time breaking through all these barriers. As said, Charles already say, I'm one of the privileged one in my region. I can afford to learn a new language, use my free time for volunteer work, and learn the international rules, but so many can't. If we really want equity, we must eliminate these barriers. More than that, we need people from this group in decision-making roles. The division of work inside the community must be fairly distributed in transparent ways, and more public recognition must be given to those who work behind the scene. Thank you. Thank you, Yanina. And uh, I think we'll uh, go on to Alex. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was a, no, that's, yes, that's fine. Please, please. I just... I do even say a little bit more, but um, hello, I, it's, uh, my name is Alex, uh, I am my pronouns are they then, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, for my day job, I work as a software engineer at Wellcome Collection in London, which is a museum and library that explores health and human experience. And I primarily focus on our digital preservation and our digital collections work. And so when I was thinking sort of about this question of what does it mean to define merit, I sort of started thinking about what is one aspect of merit that we often see in the software industry. And one aspect is often sort of workaholism, the idea that you should work, work, work. And that the, the, somebody who works all the hours in the day is somehow better than somebody who doesn't. And I sort of look at the flip side of this and I think about, well, okay, if you're able to work, 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 what that probably means is you have a lot of free time. And, and free time maybe on its own is not necessarily, it, it's, you know, some people have more free time than others. It's sort of, it's a function of other aspects of your life. How much free time you have, how much free time you can devote to work. Um, somebody, for example, who has one very well-paid job, they might have a lot of free times in the evenings versus somebody who's working two or three jobs, maybe even shift work, maybe zero hours contracts, and, 
you know, they're really struggling to make ends meet. And free time and the amount of free time you have is already an inequity, right? Some people have more of it than others, but then that can be exacerbated if the amount of free time you have becomes a lever to gain certain advantages, things like promotion or compensation or opportunities. Um, and this is something we've sort of always been keenly aware of on my, in my organization, on my team, that the amount of free time somebody has can have an impact on the opportunities they have. And so we've always sort of tried to keep an eye on this. And one thing we've tried to do is try to make sure people are not using their free time to gain an unfair advantage at work. You know, the sort of work we do, it's software development, it's an office job. It is not the sort of work where it need, we need people to put more hours in and we don't believe putting in more hours is really going to benefit you as an individual or us as an organization. And so we really don't want to incentivize our work or give people or allow people to use their free time to gain opportunities. So we, we don't pay overtime. We don't schedule overtime. We don't pay it. If you work outside office hours, that is your own. That is something you can choose to do, but you will not be financially compensated for that. And that work can't be considered when it comes to things like um, annual reviews, performance reviews, bonus remuneration. We consider what you do in those core hours and not what you do in your free time. Um, and that's for a, there are a variety of reasons why you don't want people doing overtime, but that's one of them is we don't want people using potentially an abundance of free time to gain advantages that other people might not be able to access. And then, of course, the last 18 months happened, and this has exposed the inequity and inequality of free time even more because some people have seen proportionally more draws on their time than others. Uh, for example, if you have parent, if you have if you're a parent, if you have caring responsibilities, and that was previously something that happened outside work hours or somebody else would handle for you, well, now that's your problem. If you have young kids, you used to send them to school, you came into the office, you did a day of work, you went home and collected the kids from school. Now, of course, you are having to supervise your children at the same time as working. And we know as well that um, these things disproportionately fall on women. You know, this is not parent rate. Child raising is not equally distributed. And so what we've seen is that some people on our team just aren't able to do the same number of hours as they were able to do when we were in the office. And so sort of how do we make sure again that the amount of work that they are able to do does not sort of disproportionately affect them, does not affect their access to opportunities, promotion, compensation. And so we sort of handle this in two ways. First, we've adjusted people's expect, we've tried to adjust our expectations of somebody. So, you know, if you were doing an eight hour day before, now you're doing a four hour day, well, that's okay. Then we sort of acknowledge caring, child rearing, whatever, those are important things. We only expect you to do four hours of the day job and we're not going to harangue you and harass you and say, oh, you only did four hours of work today. Why didn't you do more? We know you're doing the best you can, and we sort of adjust our expectations of people accordingly. And we don't, you know, we adjust our expectations of their output. But of course, this introduces a new risk that now someone is going to be marginalized on a team because you're expecting less of them. And just something we've also been careful to do is make sure we center them in leadership roles, in technical roles, that we continue to give them opportunities to drive things forward on the team and we respect their primacy in those projects. So I'm working on a project right now, for example, with somebody um, and she's the lead on the project. She's also got two young kids. And so she's not able, she isn't always able to do a full day, but she's still the project lead. And even if I might be putting in more hours on the project, I might be grinding away at it for longer. She is still the project lead. I still have to ask her about decisions when we're doing our all hands meeting, she is the person who reports on the side of the project because she is the project lead. We make really sure that just because you're working less hours doesn't mean we don't still, we don't still continue a full member of the team. So yeah, there's sort of some examples of how we are trying to make sure that merit is not simply how much work you can do. And we make sure that your free time, the number of hours, the amount of time you can work, the number of hours you can work does not we try and make sure that doesn't affect your access to opportunities and promotion and you know that it it does not this report it is not used as a wedge for more marginalization so yeah that's my story thanks alex uh caleb would you like to introduce yourself 
and uh, tell us about your story. Hi, uh, thanks Roland, and uh, thank you Malvika for the invitation and uh, sharing this panel. So my name is uh, Caleb uh, Kibet. I come from Nairobi, Kenya. I, my undergraduate background is in biotechnology, but I did my PhD in South Africa uh, in a predominantly uh, more or less a private university. And within the computer science department that I was part of, uh, it was predominantly white, especially within the, uh, the postgraduate uh, department. And so I was one part of a community that is predominantly white. And secondly, I was from a biology background surrounded by computer scientists. And within that community, it felt like I did not belong there. I had to learn, develop, grow, and find my place within that group. One day they took a departmental photo and I realized that I was one of the two only black people of the, uh, among us 30. And, but then as I reflected upon that, looking at the, uh, the constitution of the department and the environment that I was part of, I realized that I did not feel that I did not belong because my supervisor ensured that he created an environment where I felt that I belonged. One, the main aspect that he used was that one telling me that I belong, but not only that, by empowering me and ensuring that I have the capability that can give me a voice that is equal with the rest and I can be able to feel that I belong. And so my advocacy and my work has always been centered around uh, the concept of leaving no one behind. And I've always been interested in how can we ensure that we can bring on board others to the conversation, but not just bringing them to the conversation, empowering them, ensuring that they have the power, they have the ability when they, have, when they speak, their voice can be heard. And so that has always been my approach to advocacy, the aspect of training, uh, sensitized, ensuring that they are aware what, of the position that they can occupy. And then the next thing, empowering them to be able to occupy those positions and being able to feel that they belong. And finally, creating a community, a critical mass whereby they can be able to go on and impact change. And so when it comes to the question of redefining merit and how that makes or creates a positive impact. And I'll speak about, uh, so I run a bioinformatics incubation and mentorship hub within our institution. I'm based in a research institution for insect research. And this mentorship hub, what we are trying to do there is to empower students, undergraduate students to feel that they are part of the bioinformatics community. And when I was interviewing for this position, I this lady came and she had more or less like second law, which means she had less than 50% in undergraduate studies. But when I looked at her CV, I realized that she had gone beyond that and she had empowered herself. She had tried to learn, she had tried to grow herself. Now, if I looked at the performance of this student, I could have said they do not belong within this uh, group. But then I went ahead and asked her, why did you get a second law? You seem like a brilliant student, what happened? That's the aspect of empathy, caring to understand why and when she gave me a story i realized that really even what she managed to do what the performance that she got was even she performed beyond given the circumstances that she was part of and it's really important to understand where others come from and that's where you need to when you understand where they come from when you understand the struggles that they had and what they had to overcome to be able to belong and be part of this uh, group whichever the group it is, then you can be able to empathize and you can be able to now empower them, create opportunities for them to feel that they belong. So I will, I will just stop there and just say that when it comes to diversity and inclusion, it's really important to expand the story. There's a danger of a single story, having a single view of that person, that you see this person as a poor performer. 
I see this person as a black person, but you need to be able to understand in breath, who are they beyond what that uh, negative uh, aspect that you're looking at. So that's what I uh, will uh, speak about and we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. Wow, that was awesome. All, right, all the panelists, that was really great. Now, I'm going to just check and see if there are some things on Slido, uh, if there are any stories on Slido or is it just questions? Malvika, little help? We have one question about, uh, can the speakers please share resources in a document? Um, and the Etherpad that we have, will make sure that all the speakers have shared their talks and notes if they have any in there. Yep, excellent. So why don't we go uh, to the second uh, question, but before I, we do that, um, if anyone in the audience has, uh, would like to write down their story in the chat, um, feel free to do so. That's okay if you don't, um, but uh, let's go on to the other question. So. Uh, existing research have suggestions or advice about how existing re Ooh, hang on jumped all right uh, have suggestions or advice about how existing research software communities can help to offer better support to empower their members and before we get to uh, get people to answer that I just want to pick up a thread between uh, what Yanina and Charles were saying around these um, opportunities and the barriers that people face. And I love, Yanina, your comment around, you know, what could we have achieved if we had that support? And uh, and I just, just to tell you a little story um, to, to tie that in, talking with Charles the other day, and she told me something about uh, something she'd done and I go, oh, Wow, your your achievements are even better than I thought. And this goes back to what Caleb was saying. You know, oh my God, it's just like this is crazy. Uh, this is fantastic. And so, just being able to to do that and understand that, I think it just ties in with what you said, Yanina, and what you said, Caleb. So, um, does any of the panelists want to reach out on this one uh, for this one about uh, offer better support to empower their members? Alex? Yeah, I guess I'm sort of thinking, I'm, I'm trying to think how best to phrase this, but I guess I will sort of pull behind the curtain and sort of um, both on the both on how this panel is being run, but also like to tie back to what I was talking about earlier is that, um, sorry, I'm trying, again, I'm trying to think about this, I, I guess right, this is obviously tricky, this can be tricky, but like pay people, um, often a lot of work around particular and diversity inclusion efforts and trying to get marginalized people involved often is sort of expected to be done for free or again I talk about you know ask people to, to give up their free time um making sure you know if you can find sources of funding and I realize that's not easy but like finding sources of funding and finding ways to make sure people are compensated for the work they are doing particularly um can often can often be a way to bring in people who are marginalized because often actually marginalization will often coincide with low income so you know if somebody is wants to be part of this community but they have to go off and do some work because they have to be working to bring in income if you are able to supplement that uh then that can often be helpful which is and i want to say like all the panelists today i i believe we're being paid um there is there was another area available i don't remember who from um which again you know, you know enables us to give that free time and come and do this so i think that's that obviously only works if you have access to funding but i think that is one way that can be really useful very powerful. Thanks, Alex. Did anyone else want to uh, talk about this? Yanina or oh, Charles? Sorry. Uh, um, Charles, I can jump in on this. Um, something that I've noticed there's a there's a huge focus in open science communities on codes of conduct. But when you think about it, a code of conduct is focusing on the actions of someone not of doing an action and sanctioning them as opposed to the person who's affected and the statistics are in on survivors in our community I think it's something like one in three women in in lots of communities have been assaulted um, there's some pretty staggering statistics on 
um, LGBTQ, you know, there's, there's, we have a lot of people who've already survived and are already living with trauma. And I would like to see a shift in focus to how we support people who are already survivors of trauma, rather than there is an argument to be made that if we only focus on a code of conduct, then we are privileging the privileged, the person who is doing the action and not the people who are affected already. So I'd like to see more in the way of how we can support people at conferences, providing safe spaces where people can go and find support if they are experiencing um, unwanted traumatic memories things like that because survivors are everywhere and i'd like to see a lifting of taboos about living with these things uh where you know in conferences where often uh it's a high stress environment you're put on the spot and it can be quite um, it can bring up a lot so um that's that's my two cents is i would like to see it not the protocol not are bad necessarily but i feel that they there is this focus on them as a panacea, as if it somehow solves all diversity and inclusion issues, whereas I feel like our focus should be on the people most affected. Yeah, and Charles, if I could just extend on that, I think everyone who's worked in this space or has been triggered in this space, we realise that every situation is different. And if you come at it in a very superficial way, and you, you don't recognize that it's complicated, uh, you're going to do something that's going to potentially make the trauma worse. And if you just go, well, I did my best and you're defensive or aggressive or dismissive, you'll make it even worse. And so there's this, you know, when I put these slides together, I go, this is gonna be triggering for someone. And I kind of wanted to apologize before um, I did that. So being able to have that humility to, to recognize that this is a complex environment, I think really sort of speaks to you what you were saying there. Now, um, I was hoping we could get to the, uh, the question about most programming language uses English keywords. Is this a barrier for non-native English speakers? Uh, claro, Yanina. When someone starts speaking a different language, no one else can come in if they don't know that language. It's an instant barrier. Yeah. Yanina, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah, language is a huge barrier. Um, in, in my region, the, the, the language that most countries speak is Spanish, and it's also Portuguese. Um, and we also have some French, uh, but most of the people, we, the, the majority language is, it is Spanish. I actually learned English as a consequence of I learned how to code. It wasn't the other way around. So uh, I was <laughs> I was good at my class of English in high school because I already started to, to code when when I was little. And and it's really expensive to learn a second language. It's really expensive. It's not some something that everybody can afford. I I wasn't be able to pay for learn English until I was twenty five years old. So, uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, perhaps it's like, ah, come on, really? Yes, it, it is like that. Um, in 2017, when I met our ladies, I didn't speak in English. Uh, I'm still feeling comfortable speaking in this language. And that is a huge barrier as an academic, um, not only when you call, uh, because you have to write in English. So you have a bigger impact if it is not in English, it doesn't exist. Uh, I remember having uh, <laughs> papers rejected because of the language and people who offer me to pay someone to improve my English. I'm already poor in my country. We are poor for doing science. And you are telling me that the least, <laughs> the few money that we have, I have to pay someone for uh, correct my English. So no, I don't publish in English most of the time. When I do, because I have to do it, um, I have to write in two languages. I have to write in English to have the impact in the international scene, 
and I have to write in Spanish, but otherwise it's not useful for the people of my region. So again, it's the time and the effort is to have to do more work than the use that the native uh, English speaker has to do. Um, and about coding, it, it is funny because um, I think in Spanish, uh, when I code, I'm, I'm now used to write the lang the, the, in the programming language of choice, but um, my code many times look as Spanglish things because I use name of variable or data sets or function in Spanish and, and the rest of the code in English. An advantage of that is when I teach to call, and I teach a lot, because I think education changed life. It, it is a way we can actually improve and, and have a positive impact in our life. Um, the, the English part is the part of the language, and the Spanish part is the specific part of the problem. It is the variable, it is the, the data set, it is. So that helps uh, a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it, it is a barrier and it's not natural for us. Uh, when I learned to code, when I, I, I started with Logo when I was six years old, I didn't know English. So I can link the words of the language to previous knowledge. So, um, yeah. Gracias. So we're very, very lucky to have Liz uh, here with us. And Liz, would you be able to sort of introduce yourself and uh if you're able tell us a story of oh, i've forgotten this, the questions now um uh how someone uh, uh centered intersectionally marginalized voices that made a difference a positive difference or how someone redefined merit to make a positive difference thank you very much liz for for being able to make it very sorry for being late. Um, I first would like to um, make a comment on what Shanina said because I have been on papers where the first author has had a Latino name and I have actually read where the reviewer suggested that the individual um, improve the English and um, you know, that, that the English wasn't adequate. Um, this was a paper that I had reviewed and I had seen no problem with and had no problem understanding. Um, it, it was really, um, it was a terrible experience for the first author and it was a terrible experience for me. Um, I think that, um, that, this is a really common practice that has to stop. Um, I'm going to answer your first question about um, making differences as far as inclusion. Um, I am blind and I uh, have been an R user for over 15 years. I am mostly self-taught. There's been a wonderful explosion of resources online to help you learn R, but most of them are inaccessible. Um, I got involved a couple of years ago when um, um, I got involved with, with R when I responded to a tweet about how inclusive R was and they wanted everyone to fill out the survey about the most recent um, use R conference. And I kind of, I, when, I, when I see these um, people bragging about inclusion, sometimes I have to stop them and, and point out that the tra traditional way of doing conferences doesn't really work for people with sensory disabilities or sensory processing disorders, or even as I've learned for people who speak different languages. Um, there's an assumption with conferences that you're receiving information on two channels, both the spoken words of the presenter and the slides, um, which often have the details of things like code. And if you can't see the slides with the exact code, your abil ability to learn anything is is pretty limited. Um, so um, I was asked to get involved in, in organizing through Forwards and use our 2021. And I spent a lot of time on that work. Um, 
over the year. Um, I, I advised and worked on everything from making sure that the tweets and other uh, communications about the upcoming conference were accessible and that they included information about how accessible the conference would be. Um, everything from the website, the registration process, the process to submit an abstract to be considered for presentation, the conference platform, uh, we to help with the problem where um, you don't have access to what's on the screen, we requested that people use a Zeringan markdown template to create slides that would be really accessible so a blind person could kind of listen along using the screen reader because Zoom screen sharing content is not accessible with a screen reader. Anyway, um, we did a lot of work and the really great thing about it was that the whole team uh, came to me with questions, involved me in deciding how to make things accessible. It was a lot of work uh, coordinating um, captioners for all the sessions and things like that were just, just a, a giant amount of work. Um, but we did something really new and different, and I hope it will continue into the future. Thanks. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, we're almost getting to the end, so I wanted to hand over to Jeremy uh, for the final thing. Geez, I'm a good presenter. Hmm. Jeremy, <laughs> please continue. Thank you very much, Roland. Um, so. I, I'm going to just give some some comments to wrap up, actually, and and we we do have some time after the session for some some more informal discussion. So I hope that that many of you will join us for some some ongoing discussion. It's been fantastic to hear all of the different views um, that that people have 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 put forward and to get some really really interesting responses to the questions. Um, so really, I think my job is really just to, to give a huge thanks to both to Roland and Malvika for for chairing and moderating. The session today and to all of our panelists for taking the time to join us and for sharing their stories and their perspectives with us. Um, I also want to, to thank September RSE for accepting our panel um, and for all their help in getting things set up and organized and particularly to thank the Society of Research Software Engineering. So it was mentioned that um, there's been some funding made available and the society have have been been uh, have been very helpful in uh, providing some funds from a proposal that was led by Malvika to support this session. So we're really grateful to them, and I think that that you know these kind of opportunities are really important, as was highlighted by the speakers in trying to um, you know to help to provide more opportunities like this. Um, so yes, as I say, um, we we are going to move straight after the session into um, another Zoom chat. Um, where there's some time for informal discussion. Um, we'll have about an hour there for anybody that wants to join us. Um, and I think we'll, we'll put the link up into the chat here, but it's also in the uh, in the Etherpad document that's been, been linked there. Um, and if there's anything that you'd like to follow up on from today's session um, offline, you're very welcome to get in touch with Malvika, Roland, or myself. You can find our contact details in the Etherpad document. Again, the link is in the chat there. And I think you can find them towards the bottom of the document around, I think it's around line 175 in that rather long document, but, uh, but do, do scroll down to the bottom and you'll find the details there. Um, and yeah, I think finally, just to say um, a, a very big thank you to our audience. Thanks to everybody who posed questions and thank you all for coming along. And I hope you found this session useful and interesting and that it's given you something to, to think about and also inspired you uh, with some thoughts uh, and ideas from, from our fantastic panel. Uh, so thank you all very much. Roland, I don't know if you have any more closing comments to make or if anybody else would like to, uh, to say anything before we, we move off, but otherwise, thank you. Thank you all very much indeed. Yeah, no, I think there's also some five minute videos that are going to be available. And also I forgot to mention that this could be the start of some other sessions that we might be having around this as well. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And um, we will put the, the link again into the chat. And I hope that uh, the chat is in fact, the link is actually in the chat there. Thank you, Malvika, for putting that in. And I hope that you'll be able to, uh, to join us in follow-up discussion. 